Praise the Lord. We welcome you today in the name of Jesus. Can you say Jesus is Lord? Amen. And we thank you, those of you that are watching online as well. We welcome you today in the name of Jesus. Today we're embarking on a new series. Um, actually been thinking about sharing this series for quite a few months now. And I uh, thank the Lord for the opportunity now to be able to do that. Uh, called Understanding the Love of God. Everybody say the love of God. <clears throat> Now, we want you to come. Uh, there'll be a few weeks as we go through the series. And the reason we break up our series in uh, several weeks is so that we don't just give you so much that it's really difficult to assimilate. And so we want you to not miss. And we're excited about this series. I believe it's going to be a revealing series for each and every one of us. And this journey, I think, will take us to understand a little bit more about the love of God uh, according to the Word of God, but also in a way to understand not just the love of God, but the God of love, the God who loves. And I guarantee that uh, it, you're going to uh, learn some new things from the Word of God that perhaps you hadn't even considered. And also, uh, it may even uh, challenge you to what some of the things that you uh, believe, because we all pick up things along the way. You know, uh, our parents taught us, or maybe somebody else taught us, and uh, they're not quite in line with the Word of God, and so we want you to be ready to toss aside some of the things that maybe your own thoughts about that, because the love of God is, is a uh, doctrine, it is a teaching that is very extensive. Actually, it's all throughout the Bible. And so today, as we begin our journey through the Word of God, uh, we're going to see that God's love and God's goodness and are, are really persistent themes in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so I want to begin with a word of prayer as we get into the Word today. Father, thank you for being our God, being here. I invite the Holy Spirit, Lord, our teacher and our guide to instruct us. May your Word be clear to us. May we, Father God, submit ourselves and our thoughts and all our ways to the Word of God. We thank you, Father, for the privilege that we have to share the word week after week here from this pulpit. I pray, Father God, that the word of God will establish your people to be a people that honor you and that glorify you, that know you who, for who you really are. And so, Father, I thank you today for guiding and directing our paths. Lord, I trust in you. I believe in you. I believe, God, that you are able to uh, help me navigate through this. Lord, may all that is said and done be uh, according to what you have revealed to us in Scripture. I pray that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. So if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Psalm uh, 80, actually Psalm 63. We're going to go there. But as you're turning there, I want you to uh, take some time, perhaps uh, this week, to read Psalm 136. Psalm 136. And in it, you're going to find something very interesting. The psalm has about 26 verses, but there is a refrain that is uttered in every one of those verses. As you read the verses, this refrain appears about 26 times because there's 26 verses. And this is the refrain that the psalmist writes, for his love endures forever. And then he mentions something else about God in another verse, and he says, for his love endures forever. And it's repeated 26 times in case you're slow and you don't get it the first time or the second time or the third time. And it is repeated, as I said, uh, 26 verses. Now, David wrote in Psalm 63, verse 3, he said, Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I think about what he, what he just said. Because your love, David, esteemed right? The love of God better than life. And so he says, your love is better than life. Obviously, David understood something about the love of God that we need to understand. And he says, it's better than life. And as a result, he says, my lips will glorify you. In other words, it caused him to want to worship God as he understood the value of God's love. And then in Psalm 86, verse 15, he writes, But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Abounding in steadfast 
love. And in Psalm 36 and verse 7, he writes, How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Now, in Philippians chapter 1 in the New Testament, Paul says something interesting before I get into you know, the, the meat of what I want to share with you today. He says something that's very important for us to understand about love. And he says, and this I pray, Philippians 1, 9, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. Now he says, I pray that your love, he's talking to believers, and of course, what love is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the agape love that God has shed abroad in our hearts. Because if we are saved, if we know Christ, God's love has been poured into our hearts. And he says that this love needs to abound in knowledge. If I say knowledge. Now, why do you suppose that God's love, that you would need to have knowledge? Right? We thought love is just something, you know, that feels good and we feel good about God loving us. But there's more to it than that because feeling is an effect. It is really not a cause. But God's love, he said, must abound in knowledge, right? He prays for the people and he says in all discernment. In other words, love needs knowledge to be able to to be understood, and also discernment. And so as we talk about, as we go through this series, we talk about the love of God, understand that love, God's love, is a discerning love. All right? Now, we live in a culture where we're told that love is just something, you know, you give and make people feel good. But love is really not a feeling, not God's love. Love, is, if you read what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, I believe it's 13, about love, it is always an action. It is always causing you to take an action. And so God's love may produce feelings, but it is not a feeling. It is actually an action. Now, on almost every page of the Bible, we observe divine goodness. We read about God's tender mercies. God's loving kindness, as we read through the Psalms there, about his patience. And in the scripture, we read about God's long suffering and grace. And all of these virtues are expressions of the love of God. When we say that God loves, it means that he has tender mercy, and he is patient, and he is long suffering, and he gives grace. Now, there's a contrary to popular belief, um, the biblical doctrine of God's love is really not by any means simple. And I ask you to pray for me as I share with you uh, what I see in the Scripture on the love of God. Because it is a doctrine or a teaching that is not simple. And the reason it, is, it isn't is because when you begin to talk about love and God's love, especially God's love for the world, all of a sudden, it raises all these different questions philosophically and theologically. And some of you uh, have already heard some of them because your friends or relatives or maybe even your family have brought these up to you. You talk about a God of love. But if God is so loving, why does he send people to an eternal hell? You ever heard that one? Well, yeah, and it's a good question. It is a question that should be faced, that should be answered. Another one is, how can a loving God, the God that you Christians talk about, allow sin and suffering and pain and sorrow to continue? If he's a God of love, why doesn't he just end it all? Another one, another question that arises is, how can God allow natural disasters and pandemics and other forms of mass destruction of human suffering to exist in a universe that he created and that he is in charge of. If God is truly loving, why does he allow that? And finally, another one is why did a loving God allow the human race to be plunged into sin in the first place? Why didn't God, if he loved Adam and Eve, why didn't he just keep them in the garden? And we wouldn't have had to have death and all kinds of Human distresses come into the world because of Adam's sin. Now, many of us have been challenged by skeptics, 
as I said, by even family members or friends with such questions as these, and they've asked us to provide answers. And sometimes we, we listen to them and we shrug our shoulders and, well, I don't know, uh, and probably don't know because we haven't really stopped to think about what the Scripture teaches about God and His love in the first place. Now, the answers to many of these questions aren't always easy. And even God Himself sometimes has not revealed the full answers to us to some of these questions. But here's what God has done. He has revealed himself in the Scripture as a God of wisdom and righteousness, a God who is supremely good, and he has asked us to trust him in the midst of all the sufferings and the things that we see that are not quite right. Now, this idea of trusting God becomes easier, I think, as we begin to understand a little bit better what Scripture teaches us about the love of God. If you can understand what the Scripture teaches about God's love, it'll help you to trust the Lord even in the midst of suffering. So, I want to, in this series, series to grapple with some of these perhaps difficult questions about the love of God. But before we do that, I would like to spend some time to lay a good foundation for you about what the Scripture means when it says that God is love. We read that in 1 John chapter 4, I believe it's verse 7. Now, there are those people who believe in, in error, I think, that God can be understood solely by considering His love. In other words, all you need to do, you know, like the Beatles song, all you need is love, you know. And, and all you need to talk about God is how much He loves us and, you know, what love did and sending His Son, you know, into the world. And if we just talk about love, then everything will be fine. It'll work out fine because God, after all, is love. But I believe that um, that's an error because while God is love, that's not all He is. Right, so if you just deal with God's love, then you're only dealing with one faceted aspect of His character or of His nature. Now, there are people who, as I said, think that God can be understood solely in terms of His love, and they can't believe that God could uh, ever send someone or be angry with someone or judge someone and consign them to eternal judgment. They can't quite you know, fit those two things together, love and God uh, being uh, a God of wrath and judgment against sin. They can't see how God can be both loving and angry with sinners at the same time. So we want to consider some of these things today. Now, there are those who are on the other side, well-meaning Christians, who uh, because they want to keep their doctrine pure, uh, and so they're very cautious sometimes about even emphasizing the love of God because they think, well, you know, um, how can we emphasize the love of God in the midst of a culture that is secular and ungodly and to preach to them God's love while they're living in an ungodly way could be counterproductive. Now, those are two extremes, by the way, that present a distorted picture of God and uh, confuse the understanding or the right understanding of what it means that God is love. So, how do we avoid extremes uh, how do we avoid falling into one or the other? Well, all we talk about is God. We never mention sin or judgment or anything that the Bible mentions. Or how do we, you know, avoid the extreme where we don't tell people about love? All we talk to them about is judgment that's coming in because we don't want to make them think that, you know, God loves them while they're doing all these evil things and involved in all kinds of sin. How do we keep from falling into those extremes. I believe the way to do it is to stay squarely within the bounds of the Scripture and be willing to believe what the Scripture tells us about God and about His love. Amen? Not what we think, but what does the Scripture tells us because the Scripture is the revelation of God and the revelation of His person. And I believe that if we could do this, we could see really how wonderfully the love of God can be presented to sinners and at the same time fit perfectly well with his hatred for sin. 
So in our journey, I believe in this series that God will help us to come into this understanding of the love of God. But you and I must be willing to be ready to shed any popular notion that we may have, any sentimental notion that we may have about God's love. Because many of our own presuppositions about God need to be corrected. God's love and His holiness must be carefully understood in the light of His wrath against sin, because all of those are biblical concepts. We have to see first love from God's perspective before we can truly understand how God really loves us and how great His love is for us. You have to understand love from God's perspective first, and I hope to help a little bit this morning as we go to the Scriptures. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 3 this morning. Now, as we study together, I hope that you'll be able to sense uh, something of the glory, the heavenly glory that God wants you, I believe, to experience uh, and to learn that all the sadness and pain and sorrow of human life does not negate the love of God for humanity. On the contrary, it is only the knowledge of God's love in the midst of trials and suffering that enables us to endure and to be strengthened by them. For me to know that God loves me even when I am in the midst of a difficult time and suffering or experiencing death, for me to know that God loves me is a great comfort and it causes me to live with hope for the future. Can you say amen? Now, my prayer is that as we seek God and understanding the fullness of the love of God, we can experience what Paul prayed here for the Ephesian church. Look at it with me in Ephesians chapter 3 and beginning at verse 17. He says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge and that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, Paul says quite a few things here. And what we notice here, first of all, about God's love is that it is multidimensional. It is not just, you know, linear. There is a dimension to the love of God. Notice he mentions these uh, descriptions of dimensions, breadth, length, height, and depth of the love of God. He says that you would come to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Here's something else that he mentions. A love that surpasses human understanding or human knowledge. And it's interesting because he says here that we are to know, verse 19, the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. How do you know something that surpasses knowledge? How can you know something that is beyond, right, your ability to gain knowledge of it? Well, the reason he mentions that, again, go back, going back to the dimensional part of God's love, is that it is dimensional. It is not just linear that there is so much depth and height and breadth to the love of God. And he says that you can know the love of Christ even though it surpasses knowledge. Why? Because God is the one who has to reveal that love to you. And the love is revealed to us through the Scripture and through no less of a person than the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God's love. And thirdly, he says that when Christ is in our hearts and he reveals this multi 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 multiply dimensional love, that we can be filled, listen, with the fullness of God. How many of you want the fullness of God in your life? Boy, wouldn't that, why, wouldn't that be great to be able to walk in that fullness all the time? Well, he says it comes through the love of God. And so as the love of God in our hearts is revealed, as we begin to understand through the Scripture the multifaceted dimensional aspect of the love of God, he says that we will have the strength. Notice, I think it's verse 18, that you may have strength to comprehend. Now that is the spiritual strength 
that God, the Holy Spirit, will supply to you to understand the multidimensional aspect of the love of God so that you can know that which surpasses knowledge. So this knowledge of God isn't just for, you know, whoever. This is a love that God wants to reveal to us so that we can understand the fullness of God. Praise God. Go to Romans chapter 9. Now, I am convinced, I don't know if you are or not, but I am convinced from the Scripture that God is sovereign in the salvation of sinners. I'll repeat that again. I am convinced through the Scripture that God is sovereign. I mean, that means that God has nobody, when, when we say that God is sovereign, we mean that God is in control of it all. There isn't anything or anyone that he is subservient to. When God, when we say that God is sovereign, the Bible says that God is, has everything under the control of his hand. You see, if, if you don't believe that God is sovereign, that he ordains all things, then you can never trust that whatever promise he gave you, he is going to keep. Because if God does not control everything, then there could be something that could stop that promise from coming to pass, couldn't it? If God doesn't control it, then he can't control it. And if he can't control it, that means that God could make a promise like Jesus is coming back, but you know what? Wow, there was something God has in control, so he's not coming back after all because God is not in control of this particular thing that is keeping him from coming back. Well, the Bible never talks about God in those terms because God is sovereign. Say it with me. God is sovereign. So God is sovereign in salvation. And, the, and what I mean by that, and Paul says here in Romans 9.16, 9, that God is sovereign in salvation. He saves sinners, and so he says in verse 16, it doesn't depend on man. It does not depend on man who wills or on man who runs. But on who? But on God, he says, who has mercy. So salvation doesn't depend on man. I know that there are people, there is a part in, uh, you know, of the Christian church that believes that. That man is the one that makes a choice and chooses God. Uh, you know, uh, and people say, well, I found the Lord, you know, in 1976. Uh, well, you didn't do such, any such thing because God was not lost. You, you were lost. And God, Jesus came seeking you. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, didn't he? Because none of us were seeking for God. Romans chapter 3 tells us that. None of us were ever reaching out to God. We were lost and we were bound in our sin. And so Paul says it doesn't depend on man's will. It doesn't depend on man who strives or runs or works for it, but on God who has mercy. So we're saved, we're redeemed, not because of anything good in us, not because of anything that we have done, but because God chose us. Everybody say chose. Now I'm using biblical words. We're going to read those in just a minute. These are just my ideas. This is what God says in the Word. God chose us unto salvation. He chose, the Bible says, certain individuals and passed over others. I know that makes some people mad. Well, uh, your problem isn't with me. It's with the Scripture. Because everybody's not going to be saved. Are they? No. There are people, there are some in sin who are going to be judged by God, the righteous judge. And so God has chosen some individuals. He's passed over others. He made that choice. Listen. In eternity past. Ephesians 1 4 tells us he took that decision before the foundation of the world, before you and I were even here. And he chose without regard to anything that he saw in the elect. He chose you, if you're in Christ today, without looking at you or anything that you would ever do. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, it says that God did this according to the good pleasure of His will. Verse 5, according to the good pleasure of His will. All right? And then the next verse says, He did it for a reason. So that you and I would be to the praise of the glory of His grace. So God made that decision in eternity because He's sovereign in salvation. He chose 
right? If you're in Christ, you, before you were even here, and he did it so that you as a redeemed individual, as a redeemed person who could not have saved yourself, would praise the glory of what? Of his grace. That he did it by grace. By grace you have been saved, the Bible says, through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So we stand here today as Christians, if you're a believer, and our responsibility is to glorify God and worship him for his grace. Do you do that? Do you thank the Lord that God has saved you because of his grace? And he did it through Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Can you say amen? Now, we're saved by God's sovereign election, by God's sovereign choice. Now, what does election have to do with God's love? I was talking to someone the other day online, and they were they were, they, were deb- they were fighting, actually, the idea of predestination. They said, well, I don't believe in predestination. I said, well, then you don't believe the Bible. Because the word predestination... And destined appears several times in the Bible, doesn't it? Paul talks about it. We have been predestined, right? And, and so uh, he didn't know what to say after that. He just said, well, I just don't believe that, you know, God would do it. I said, well, you might not believe a certain idea of predestination. But if you're a Christian and you believe the Bible, you have to believe in predestination. Because the word is there. What are you going to do? Cut it out of your Bible and say, I don't like that term? Of course not. Now, what does predestination mean? Well, look at the word. pre Destination, right? Made out of two words, right? The prefix is the word pre, which means what? Means before, right? And destination is what? It's the place you're going to end up. It's your destiny, right? And so God fixed your destiny before. Oh, some of you didn't get it. (laughs) God fixed before which is what Ephesians 1, 4 says, before the foundation of the world, God chose us in Christ. That was very clear. He did that. And he did it, why? By the pure affection of his own will. The scripture says that Ephesians 1, I believe it's about verse 11. So what does election have to do with God's love? Well, election arises from the love of God. As a matter of fact, those whom God chose, Jeremiah 31, 3 says, he loved with an everlasting love. He loved us with an everlasting love. Therefore, listen, with loving kindness, he is what? I have drawn you. See, this is what God does with those whom he elects. He loves them with an everlasting love. He doesn't start loving you when you, you know, kind of, Come to Christ and you get yourself in order? No. He loved you before. He loved you when you were a mess, when you were still bound in sin. And then he says, his love drew you to him. Now, isn't that what Jesus said? No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. Absolutely. Right? So, no one can come to Jesus. Uh, He himself said it's a possibility unless the Father what? draws it. Well, here in the Old Testament, we read about that drawing. And how was it done? It was done by love. It was God's love that drew you to Him. You didn't come to Him because you were a little smarter than most people and figured out that you needed to be saved. No. If you were saved and you are saved, it's because God the Father drew you to Jesus and gave you to Him so that Jesus could then impart eternal life to you. Now, It's true that, uh, or I should say, if it's true that election arises from the love of God, what about those who are passed over? What about who are non-elect? What about those whom the Bible says are reprobates? So I'll ask the question, are they loved by God? First of all, let me share with you that God is sovereign over the exercise of his love. I want you to grab a hold of that truth. You want to write it down if you need to. God's love, or God is sovereign, I should say, over the exercise of his love. 
What does that mean? Well, sometimes people think, you know, well, God loves everybody. Doesn't God love everybody, Pastor? Well, yes. But he doesn't love everybody in the same way. And as a matter of fact, God is not obligated to love everybody alike. And I know that people, again, because you haven't really thought about this, and and so people, you know, fight over things that, I was talking to someone about that, and over things that they've really not even considered. Well, God loves everybody the same. Well, no, he doesn't. The Bible doesn't say that. Now, God loves everybody, whether they're elect or not elect, and I'm going to show you in a minute. But here, just understand this, that the Bible talks about the children of God in a different way than it talks about those who are not his children. As a matter of fact, the Bible calls God's people his beloved. You ever read that in the Bible? John writes, he says, beloved, right? And he addresses them as beloved of God. Now, you never read about, right, sinners in that, with that, uh, uh, people who are outside of Christ, that God loves them that way. He does, never calls people who reject God beloved of God. Because again, even though God does love people who are away from Him, it is a different kind of love. You say, well, I don't understand that. How could God love differently? Well, let me put it to you this. How many of you have children? Now, do you love me? How many of you love me? Now, do you love me like you love your children? Well, of course not. You'd be lying if you say you did. Right? I say, now, if you do believe that, give me access to your bank account, all right? <laughs> and you can prove your love, right? No, we love our children. They're, part, they're our seed. They're part of us, right? They came from our loins, right? They were, they were created by God, but they're ours specifically, there's nothing we wouldn't do for our children. I mean, there are things we would do for other people, but not like we would for our own children. Is that right? Yeah, so you can love people differently, can you? Well, God does the same thing. God loves his children. He calls them beloved. And he loves those who are not in children, but in a different way. Now, that's why I said that God is sovereign over the exercise of his love. And it is really a folly, listen, to think that God loves everybody alike or that he is compelled by some kind of what we call today fairness to love everybody equally. You're not going to get very far with God when you, stop, when you start thinking about the way you think in the culture. People talk about, well, we got to be fair and we got to be, you know. If you want God to be fair with you, he'll send you to hell. Right? If justice is what you're looking for, you know, I don't want justice. I want mercy. I want grace. That's what I want. Because if God deals with us purely by justice, none of us could ever make it. But it's folly to think that God loves everybody the same and that somehow he has to be fair in the way that he loves everybody equally. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. And let's read here. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6. And God says something here to Israel that I want, that bears upon Israel. This idea of God loving everybody equally. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. And God says to his people Israel, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. In other words, to me, you are a holy people. Why? Because God took them as a nation. He set them apart from all the other nations of the world. The Lord your God has what? Chosen you, talk about Israel, to be a people for himself. Right? Now, God didn't choose the Mexican people. All right? Now, does God love Mexican people? Of course he does. But he didn't choose them, right, to be a special people unto himself. Now, he chooses Mexicans. <laughs> but he did choose the Mexico, right, as the nation that was special to him. Now, notice what he says. A special treasure. Listen. Above what? Above all the peoples on the face of the earth, Israel, you are chosen to be a special treasure for me, God says. Now, he says in verse 7, the Lord did not set his love on you. He didn't choose you because you were more in number than other people. You were the least of all the people. In other words, God's love for Israel wasn't compelled by what was in them. All right? Because God's sovereign love, again, he decides 
whom he loves and how he will love them. And he says, I've chosen you. I've made you special above all the nations of the world. Now, you can say, well, that's not fair. Right? The age of tolerance, we got to be fair. We got to be equal. Everybody's got to be equal. Well, God said, not here. All right? I, well, why, why did you choose Israel? Why did you, why did you choose China or Japan? Why, did you choose, why, did, why was Israel the special treasure? He says in verse 8, because the Lord loves you. Right? God said, I've chosen you, and I chose to what? To love you. Because if you study the Scripture, you know that Israel wasn't any different than all the other nations. I mean, they were just as bad sometimes, and even worse, because they had been given so much, and they still went out and rebelled against God, right? And so God says, it wasn't because of you. It was because I chose to love you. I placed my love upon you and made you special out of all the nations of the earth. And anybody can think, well, you know, that's not fair and all of that. But God says, my love is sovereign. And I am sovereign in the exercise of that love. You know, he doesn't love Israel or he doesn't love you because he's under any kind of obligation to love you or to love everyone the same. Nothing but God's own sovereign pleasure, the Bible says, compels him to love sinners. Now, don't miss that. Only God's pleasure compels him to love sinners. God decided that. Just like he decided here that above all the nations of the world, he would choose Israel. So the fact that some sinners are not elected to salvation is not proof that God's attitude towards them is not sincere and is devoid of a sincere love. Look at Romans chapter 2, verse 4. God's goodness. Everybody say God's goodness. And listen, and God's forbearance and his patience are mercies that flow out of God's love and are shown even to the most stubborn of sinners. Look at what Paul says here in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. He says, do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering? Not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to what? To repentance. Now, folks, listen. If you ever repented, or when you came to Christ and you repented of your sins, guess who was at work in that repentance? It was God. Because again, God is sovereign in salvation. You would never have come if it had been left on your own. But it was the goodness of God, the forbearance of God, the patience of God, that goodness, which by the way, these are uh, merely uh, extensions, or I should say there are uh, uh, evidences of the love of God. Because God loves a person, he's good to them. Because God loves somebody, he is forbearing, right? Because God is love, he is long-suffering, he waits, he's patient. And he says, don't you know, Paul is saying here, that God has shown that love to you by doing this, and he did it so that you could come to repentance? Now, how many of you can see the love of God in that? Now, this is toward people that don't know him, by the way. And that's why I say, does God love people who are non-elect and who are, who are rejectors? Yes. He shows it by being forbearing, by being long-suffering toward them, by waiting and calling them to repentance. But Paul says in verse 5, look at it. He tells us here that these mercies of God ought to lead us to repentance, but oftentimes there are people, there are sinners, right, who spurn those mercies of God, and instead, what do they do? Well, something happens when they spurn the love of God. People say, well, does God love people that don't know Him and that don't love Him? Yes. He's very patient toward them. He's trying to bring them to repentance. But listen, but in accordance with your hardness of, of heart, your impenitent heart, Paul says, you are treasuring up for yourself what? Wrath. Now, remember, it's all about love. 
right? The mercies of God, the patience of God, the tolerance of God. He said all of those are manifestations. God is love towards you so that you come to repentance. But if you don't, you're, if you continue in your impenitent heart and heart, something else happens. He said you'd expect something else. You're treasuring up for yourself something. What is it? Wrath. Now, what wrath? What wrath? God's wrath. The day of wrath, he says, and the revelation of the what? The righteous judgment of God. Do you know what the righteous judgment of God is there? It's his wrath. It is the judgment that falls upon impenitent, hard-hearted sinners who have been shown by God love, patience, tolerance, and they reject it. And so when you reject the love that God gives you, even though you don't belong to Him, again, it is a different type of love, but it is love nevertheless. If you reject it, there's only one thing else that can happen, and that is that you begin to treasure to yourself wrath, more and more wrath. Now, folks, before you say, well, God loves him, doesn't he? Yeah, well, how can he be talking about wrath? Because wrath is righteous for those who reject God's love. I know today people don't want to talk about sin. They don't want to talk about what happens if you reject God. But folks, that's not me. And if you don't like that kind of preaching, well, there's a bunch of churches you could go to where you don't ever hear that. But I'm going to tell you that that, it needs to be preached because if we don't do that, if we tell people, God loves you, He doesn't care how you live, we're sending them to hell. And we're helping them treasure up for themselves wrath against the day of wrath and the coming righteous judgment of God. Folks, God is righteous in judging people who reject Him and reject His love. There are a couple of amens, but it's true. Now, the hardness of sinful man's heart is really the only reason he persists in his sin. Notice Paul says, you harden your heart and you treasure up more and more. Treasure is a building up, right? I'm getting more. But I'm getting more not of what I need, but what I eventually will deserve if I reject Christ and the message of the gospel. Now, I want to acknowledge to you, however, that explaining God's love toward the reprobate, toward the non-elect is not as simple as some people try to make it. But I do want you to see what we do know about God in the Scripture. Go to Romans chapter 9, verse 17. And I'm just going to give you a couple. I mean, we could spend a lot of time here because there's, it's all over the Bible. But just to give you a simple idea of what we know about God in the Scripture. And this is why I I said earlier that if you are the type of person that only believes that we'll just talk about God and His love and, you know, everything will be fine. Well, the Bible doesn't do that. As a matter of fact, the Bible reveals God's love for the sinner, for the person who is lost and are rejecting Christ, and God's love for His own special children who are below part of His family. But look at, first of all, uh, here what it says, Romans 9, verse 17. It says, as it is written... Romans 9, excuse me, not 17, but 13. I'm sorry, Romans 9, 13. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, God said, but Esau I have what? Now I know that there are people, you know, read the Bible like that. They say, well, that, that's not really what it means. It just means he loves him less. <laughs> You know, if I tell you I hate you, does that, does that kind of give you the idea that I love you a little less and I love other people? <laughs> no, it says, Jacob, God said, I have loved. I mean, it is a declaration out there. And, and you can't, you know, if you believe the Bible, if you're a Bible believer person, you, you've got to deal with that. Esau, I have hated. Now, 
God can love and hate at the same time and be consistent in his character? Yes. I'm going to show you before we close today how really that's what you and I are called to. We just don't think about it enough. But I think it was Spurgeon who said that one time a lady came up to him and said, uh, Dr. Spurgeon, he said, or Pastor Spurgeon, he said, I do, that scripture you read today, Esau, I have hated. You know, I always thought God, God's a God of love. He can't, why does it say Esau, I have hated? I, I don't understand that. And, and that's appalling to me. And so Spurgeon said, I agree with you. It's appalling to me too. And she says, it is? Yes. He said, because there's something even more appalling than that in the scripture, he said, because I can understand God hating Esau. What I don't understand is why he loved Jacob. Now that's appalling. Right? I mean, Jacob was a deceiver, a trickster. You know, he did everything he could. and stole his brother's birthright, right? Uh, and, and, I mean, he was a scoundrel. If you read the life of Jacob and the life of Esau, and you don't come away with, what? I mean, if I'd have been God, I would have loved Esau. I mean, Esau was a hard worker, as a man, you know, disciplined in his work. And Jacob was a deceiver. And, and God turns around and says, I love Jacob. Oh, you're wrong, God. <laughs> well, again, God is sovereign in the exercise of his love. So when God, we tell God, well, why did you love Jacob and hate Esau? He said, because I decided to love him. End of story. And so the lady said, well, Spurgeon said, well, I, I, I can understand perfectly well why he hated Esau. I mean, he's a sinner. What I can't understand is why he loved Jacob. Now, look at Psalm 7, verse 11. Now, by the way, people say, well, God loves everybody. Yeah. But God hates Esau. Yeah. Both are true. How they fit together, that's where we have a problem. That's where we need discernment to understand the love of God. Psalm 711 says this in the New King James Version. God is a just judge. And God is angry with the wicked every day. So who's he angry with? Wicked people. I mean, that's a fact. You can't get away from it. You can't try to, well, he's not really angry. He's just not pleased. No, God hates sin. And he hates people who live in sin. He's angry with them every day. You say, but didn't you just say that God is long-suffering and compassionate and he's tolerant and he's wanting to bring them to repentance? Yes, that's called love. So God loves people who don't know him and he hates the wicked every day. He's angry with them. Yes. See, there's more to the love of God than we have understood. And John 3.36 is an interesting one as well. Go over there. John 3.36, the NIV says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Now, here's an interesting a revelation or truth that is, that is presented to us. If you love God, if you believe in the Son, you have what? Eternal life. Many of us here who know the Lord. We have. We're recipients of eternal life. But he says, if you reject the Son, you will never see life. But there's something else. God's wrath remains on you. Now, notice it doesn't say that God's wrath will come on you. It says it remains, which means what? It's on every sinner in it. Every person who's outside of Christ has the judgment, wrath of God over their 
life. Why? Because God, the righteous judge, is going to judge them someday for their sin. Thank God that you and I, if we're in Christ, we've surpassed that. Hallelujah. (laughs) Glory to God. But don't think it's because of you. It's because of him. So a person who doesn't know the Lord, God is loving them by being tolerant and patient toward them and calling them to repentance. But at the same time, his anger and wrath is over them because of their the way they live and because of their sin. And his judgment is ready to come on them. They will never see life. Folks, this ought to concern us. So many people that have died in these past years. And oftentimes I wonder, did they die without Christ? What a tragedy to live your life and die. And the wrath of God, the anger of God is over your life because of sin. How tragic. And then in Romans chapter 1, go over there, verse 18. And by the way, these are probably scriptures that most people never read. <laughs> right? No, let's go to John 3.16. Or, uh, that's fine. That's great. But folks, we need the whole counsel of God. Lest we deceive ourselves and deceive other people. Romans chapter 1.18, Paul says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness or all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now, this is quite an utterance by the Apostle Paul, and he reveals something here very interesting. Because earlier, in the few verses before that, he said that the gospel reveals something. He says the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. Thank God for the gospel. It reveals the righteousness of God for all who believe. But now he turns to the wrath of God and he says, now the wrath of God also reveals something. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. It's not going to be revealed. It's already being revealed against what? Godlessness and wickedness of what? People. You ever heard people say, well, God hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. And that's, that's kind of a phrase. It's not in the Bible, by the way. But that's kind of a phrase people use to try to get away from some of the things I just shared with you today. Well, yeah, God, yeah, he's angry at sin. He loves the sinner, but he hates sin. Well, it's true in the fact that he does love sinners. But here's the thing. Does God send sins to hell? Or people? So God doesn't just hate the sin, does he? Somebody said, I don't know why I came this morning. You came because God wants you to understand, to be discerning about his love. And quit making love some kind of emotional trip that you try to get people to ride on. God's love is deep. God's love is multidimensional. God's love is revealing. But God says, his wrath is revealed from heaven. Listen, against all godlessness and wickedness of people. Now, what do these people do? Why is God angry with godlessness and wickedness in people? Because they suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now, I realize that he's talking here about, you know, people that don't know God. He's angry with the sinner every day. He's angry with the wicked every day. Psalm 7:11 says. Well, he says God's, re- God's wrath is revealed from heaven. It shows. And it's against people who suppress the truth by their unrighteousness. 
And as I was meditating over that, I stopped for a moment. I said, Lord, do I ever suppress the truth by unrighteousness? And you do too. Every time that you sin against God, you are suppressing the truth of God by the way you're living. Now, what does the Bible here say that that causes God to be? Angry. You know, the only reason that you are different in Christ and God's anger doesn't come against you is because of Christ. Not because your sin is any less than theirs. As a matter of fact, Paul said to the Corinthian church, warning them about not sinning, he says, do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Do you want to provoke God to jealousy? Really? You want to do that? I don't think so. Are we stronger than him, Paul says? <laughs> no. So I was meditating. I said, Lord, do I ever suppress the truth by wickedness? And boy, I had to stop there and I had to just bow my head and tears came out of my eyes and I said, I do do that, don't I, Lord? And if that causes you anger, why would I do that? And so you have to understand as, as Christians, we're privileged we're special to God, but like Israel, not because of us, but because he chose us, but because he placed his love upon you. How should you live when you realize that? And I said, oh, God, remind me. I don't want to be that who suppressed the truth by their unrighteousness and their wickedness. By the way, if you want to know what Paul is talking about here, how is the wrath of God revealed? Read all of chapter 1 and you're going to see it. He talks about people who are on the decline morally and spiritually. You know, we hear today about people say, well, you know, we are free. And today, you know, we, you know we, they celebrate this LGBTQ, QWX, YZ, and they keep adding letters. I can't keep up with all of them. You know, and, and we're, we're free. We're a movement. We don't, and homosexuality, Elizabeth, we're free now. We can marry whoever, the same sex, anybody we want. We're free. And they don't know that that is a manifestation of the anger of God. To live bound in immorality is a judgment from God to people who reject the truth. Now, that won't go very far in our culture. People will call you a bigot and a hater. But folks, if I tell you the truth, I'm not a hater. I'm your best friend. Rather than letting you go under the idea that you are free now, that you can do what you please and do what you want with your body, God says, no, you're a slave. And you don't even so if you're caught in that sin, listen, God is trying to get you to repent. His love and His patience and His kindness is shown to you. It's not freedom. It's a manifestation, Paul says, of the judgment of God. And if that's true, people... We're a nation under judgment. God is not pleased with what's going on in America. When President Obama lit the White House and said, okay, same-sex marriage now is a law of the land, he doesn't realize how much it angered God. But he will one day if he doesn't repent. Because to be a leader who opened the door to that which God hates 
is a very, very dangerous thing. And so pray for him when you remember that. Pray for our leaders because they have opened the door in many ways to judgment to come upon our country. You know, we can't sweep away the severity of the truth by denying, you know, God's hatred for the wicked and wickedness. But we should never regard God's hatred for evil and for the wicked as a blemish of his character. Because we usually think of hatred as a bad thing. But listen, folks, in God, hatred is a virtue. If God is going to love, he must hate everything that isn't lovable and love-worthy. When God, the Bible says that he hate Esau, it isn't a meanness in God. It isn't a streak of meanness. It isn't a blemish in his character. It is a perfection in his character. Now, we get angry because we get selfish. But God's anger isn't motivated by selfishness. God's anger is motivated by his holiness. Anything that is unholy moves God into activity. And that is his hatred of sin. And if he is just and holy, he must, he must respond to that which is unholy. God is, the other aspect of God's character is jealousy. How many of you have ever been jealous? Right, but your jealousy was the same as God's. Your jealousy is usually because of your own selfishness. But God's jealousy is not his selfishness in his character. It is a perfection of his character. God is jealous for the right things. He is jealous because he is holy. And he's always zealous and jealous for that which glorifies his name. I want to close with Romans chapter 9. I want you to go there. And we're going to talk in the coming weeks a little bit more in depth about this love that the Bible talks about, the love of God, this God who loves the multidimensional aspects of the love of God. Romans chapter 9 and verse 12. You see. No, I'm sorry. It's 12 verse 9. I'm sorry. Son, I gave you the wrong scripture there. Romans chapter 12 verse 9. I meant to correct it here. I didn't do it. Romans 12, 9 says, let love be sincere without hypocrisy. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Now, Paul is here writing to Christians who have the love of God in them. He's telling us the love of God is sincere and must be sincere. There's no hypocrisy in the love of God. But notice immediately when he says, love, if I say love, love must be sincere. Hate. What? Wait, 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 wait. Let's back up. Love must be sincere. Hate. Hate what is evil. See, you can love and hate at the same time, can't you? Of course you can. You love what is good. Your love is sincere. But in loving and in loving the way God loves, there are those things which you must hate. He says, hate what is evil and cling to what is good. This is Paul giving this principle of Christian living to the church. Now, he declares that we can love sincerely while hating at the same time that which is evil, while holding fast what is good. Folks, if we can, God certainly can. If we can love sincerely, God loves sincerely, we can hate what is evil, and that's why God hates 
evil. Because he loves. And his love is so pure that he must hate that which is against love. In the coming weeks, I hope to go, as I said, a little bit further in the Scripture and help you to see the congruence, the agreement, the harmony of God's love and the perfection of his holy hatred for evil. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. It isn't always easy to speak to people about the depth of your love and who you are. Because we have been often deceived by our culture. We have received God uh, sayings and we've picked up things in our own understanding not knowing God that your love is deep wide it is its breadth and its length are beyond what we can understand but yet you call us to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge And yet you give us the strength to be able, Lord, to perceive it and to live it and to understand it. Father, I pray for every one of us. It is our heart cry to live in your love and to love as you love and to hate what you hate. Not just in others, but in ourselves. Oh, God. Open up to us an understanding and the depth of the love that you have, not only for the world, but for us, your children, that we may live, Lord, completely controlled by that love, filled with the love that you have deposited in our hearts to live, God, that others may know that you are a God who cares for them and loves them, but also God that will one day judge the world in righteousness. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil, your word says. Help us to be the same. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.